All right. Welcome everybody to workshop four, our makeup workshop four. So first thing, I guess we have some announcements here. Um, we have we're having a Ram Ride fundraiser for the CSU IEEE Student Club on January twenty third. We need drivers and navigators. Um, to sign up, you just fill out a form and provide all those scanned documents you see on the right. Looks like driver's license, CSU ID, uh, insurance card, and something else. <laughs> uh, all, I think that might be your card information. But anyways, uh, so yeah, you find that on ramride.colostate.edu slash documentation. Um, just make sure you sign up for uh, the January 23rd by the 22nd. We we need at least 30 people, I believe, to get the full fundraising amount. That would be awesome. Oops. All right. All right. And with that, welcome to Workshop 4, which is DC and servo motors, as well as piezo sensors. All right. So first thing, with DC motors, um, kind of based on... Uh, all electromagnetics. So kind of how it works is a voltage is applied across the leads. Uh, it doesn't matter what direction. If you change the direction, you simply change which direction the motor will spin. As you can kind of see with these neat little animations, um, basically there's these two leads um, here. Um, so once they come in contact with the the voltage you apply across it, it sort of turns on the magnet one direction, and then see there's that little brake that keeps spinning around. So as it crosses that brake, it it basically switches the polarity so it can continue to rotate instead of just stay stuck in between there like it's trying to get to, but it never actually gets there. So how you kind of hook that up, um, you need to add a diode in between the leads. Um, make sure um, that in this picture, uh, it's kind of pointed so that um, on the schematic, the arrow is pointing towards the 5 volt. So let's drop a schematic of that here. So basically, uh, you want the diode to be to to be in such a direction so that if there's a higher, if for whatever reason there's a there, oh, so the DC motor kind of gives a kickback voltage. Or it's, no, it's called kickback EMF. Uh, once you stop running it, and you this diode protects you protects the Arduino from that kickback EMF. So as you can see here, we have the Arduino and our motor here. So we have a diode essentially out like that, with the positive voltage being on the top, and then ground being on the bottom. So that way, whenever when the motor stops and it gives that kickback EMF, uh, that 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 current can safely flow through the diode kind of back into the top of the motor so that it doesn't go into the Arduino and damage it. Um, so another component we're going to use in this workshop here is the um, potentiometer. It's also, it's basically just a variable resistor. Um, what it is, is between pins 1 and 3 here, um, it's just 10 kilo ohms on the one we have. It can be different depending on which one you get. And when you turn the knob, it basically moves a contact between the two, um, and then that that the that contact is connected to pin two. So it essentially lets you change the resistance between pins one and two, or two and three, by adjusting that knob. 
So as you turn the knob, uh, the resistance between 1 and 2 can either shrink, and then at the same time, the resistance between 2 and 3 will do the opposite. It'll grow. Or if you spin it the other way, then R2 will go down, and this one will get bigger. And it basically acts as a voltage divider that you can control by turning the knob. Okay, and then we have our NPN transistor here. Um, essentially how this works, uh, it's basically a digital switch. Um, anyone who's taken three or ECE331 or 332 will know it's a little bit more complicated than that. But for our purposes, it's basically just a digitally controlled switch. Um, these are mainly used if you want to control kind of a, a higher power source using a smaller power source. In our case, uh, the Arduino can only push, I believe, 40 milliamps from each digital pin. This will allow us allow us to control a higher current using just our, those digital pins. So essentially what you can do is you can connect the motor and you'll see this later too connect the motor kind of down here uh, below the emitter positive and then negative to ground and this will just be your voltage source and then you send when you send a, a high signal to the base here it allows current to flow through the transistor So now we're going to do our first project here, not your biggest fan. So basically we're just going to create a fan that you can change the speed with our variable resistor potentiometer thing. So here's our schematic. I'm going to put this together here. You can explain it more. Yeah, so basically um, ignore this P. Oh, before I forget, so when you're looking up components to put on here, um, note that the NPN transistor looks exactly like the TMP36 temperature sensor. Um, make sure on that little the TMP, it should say 2N uh, 3904. 3904. If it's if it says TMP thirty six, that's the wrong one. Don't use it. So again, that's two N three nine zero four. Can I read that? Yes. Okay. Cool. So basically, what this schematic is showing is you have kind of our sensor input here. So we have five volts going to our potentiometer, the I believe that's pin one. And then we are sensing with the analog input here, pin two, and pin three is just going to ground. And then we have our output pin, which has to be on one of these squiggly line PWM pins on three. That's connected to the middle, the middle. Got a pair of needles, pliers. I don't. Oh yeah. It's connected to the middle uh, pin on that NPN transistor. It's a little bit confusing in this. And make sure on the rightmost. Oh, I mean this is with the flat side facing towards you in this. So the flat side of the NPN transistor is facing towards you. Connect the rightmost pin to 5 volts. That'll be our voltage source. And the leftmost pin goes to the one of the leads of the motor. In this case, this is the, um, the higher voltage pin, I guess, on our motor, which we're, we're making it red. It's green in the schematic. It doesn't really matter. It more just changes what direction it goes. But... And then you want to make sure you have this uh, diode, the EMF protecting diode here with the line towards the NPN connected wire of the motor. And if you notice real quick, what I'm just doing with the uh, pliers and the potentiometer is I'm just using a pair of needle nose pliers to bend uh, some green wires into a hook so that I can attach them to the terminals of the potentiometer. Yes. Yeah, so, so they can then be put into the breadboard.
These weren't very breadboard friendly potentiometers, but they work pretty well. And then, of course, the other end of the motor connects to ground. Um, so, this end of the diode, motor, and the potentiometer all connect to ground there. So, Sorry, it'll be just no, here it goes. So we're just assembling this here. <laughs> There's okay. that. Get this out. So remember when you're making this to be especially careful about the connections that you make with the NPN transistor because if you put it in backwards and then try to apply too much current across it, it can it can fry. Right. It can it, the it, transistors and things like that can be pretty sensitive components. And so again, that's you want the flat side of the transistor to be facing you in this schematic, um, so that the so the flat side facing you, then the rightmost pin is connected to five volts, leftmost pin is connected to the motor. Middle pin is connected to our output pin three. We got pin three going to the center mm -hmm. pin on the NPN. And of course, we have our connection to the motor from the leftmost pin and then the rightmost pin is going to connect to 5 volts. Now I'm just putting it into the same rail as the potentiometer because they all go to the Arduino's 5 volt supply. Wait a minute. I believe this one goes yeah, to ground. Yes, it does. Yeah. So many wires. Oh, and before we forget, let me grab the tape so we can tape the end of the motor so you can see it moving. Okay, so we're going to put tape on the motor, just kind of flat with the pin in the center like that, hold it down, kind of make kind of a fan-like thing, so when it spins, this will spin around like that. Alright, yeah, and that should be all connected up. Make sure, uh, especially when working with semiconductor components like transistors, to always double check your circuits yes. before you before you plug them in. Well, you plug them in and render them useless because it is connected incorrectly. Yes. All right. So now we're going to go into the code, and we have. So this is just a, so far we just kind of defined three. You define them pins, which of course we have the output for the motor and the input for our reference voltage from the potentiometer. And then we have to define them as outputs and inputs, and then we'll start with writing a zero to the motor so that it does not spin. And then you see this is kind of the same code with the void loop added. For our loop, we just want to read in the read in our input, and then we simply send it to the output. And if you notice here, so we read in our input as an integer, and then we send it straight out, dividing it by four. This is of course because our analog write uh, can have a max of 255, a uh, value of 255, 0 to 255, and our in value is a 10-bit, so it can be anything from 0 to 20, or 10, 
1023. And of course, if you divide 1023 by 4, you get slightly less than 255. And that works for us. So it, you're essentially converting a 10 bit number to an 8 bit resolution. Um, also, if you don't feel like typing this whole code out yourself, it is on our website. All right, so then you just upload it and run. Let me open this up and upload it here. All right, so we want, of course, the Arduino Uno, COM3, and upload. All right, it is done. And then here's our demo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then like the we part. forgot to <laughs> see. Always double check your connections. Even when there's something simple like that, it goes to analog zero. And that's still being funky. Well, we seem to be experiencing technical difficulties. There it is. It was a ground pin. Oh. Not a pin 13. There we go. See, when you turn it one way, it starts speeding up. Now you turn it back down, slow it down. Yay! Now watch out for situations when the motor kind of does something like this, when it kind of jerks, because that's called a stall, um, and it's actually a little bit dangerous uh, because when the motor stalls, it draws significantly more current than when it's running freely like this. When a motor is loaded in general, like if you were to put a wheel on this motor and use it as a rover, you want to be uh, keep in mind the fact that when you put the wheel on a surface and it becomes loaded by friction, then the motor is going to draw a lot more current than it would if it were just running freely. So you have to plan your circuit to be able to supply. Um, you have to design your circuit to be able to supply the stall current, not the free running current, and that should be a property of the motor gearbox combo or whatever it is that you that you purchase right so that's why we use the npn to drive it mm -hmm. instead of coming straight from the arduino right and we drive it and we drive the uh, the current source for the for the motor driven by the npn is actually the the 5 volt rail from the arduino so that's coming directly from the usb port which can run half an amp so 500 milliamps maximum whereas each pin from the arduino can only supply what was it 40 I maximum 40, so it's a to little, a maximum total from the Arduino of 200. Right, so a little less than 10% mm -hmm. per pin. Right, but the rail can supply a lot more power Which than the pins can. That. Yes. Yep. Okay. So our next project here is a knock sensor. Real quick, I just want to make uh, one more point. Uh, before we move on about why we why we use why we want to use like the the Arduino to control motor speed as opposed to just hooking it up to the right to the potentiometer and that's because if we were to just hook the motor up to the center lead of the potentiometer to adjust the voltage across the motor there's a certain point at which there isn't enough potential across it to actually make, get the motor spinning um, so there's a very I guess there's a relatively high 
lowest possible speed that the motor can run when it's being just driven by voltage changes from the potentiometer. However, when we connect it to the pulse width modulation control driven by the Arduino, we can achieve a much finer range of possible speeds from all the way down to really, really slow, where you can, where the motor, all the way down to where the motor begins to stall, all the way up to blisteringly fast. Right. So, and this is because with the PWM, you're not actually getting a lower analog voltage. Mm -hmm. You're simply getting a really small duty cycle of the high 5 volt voltage, which is a lot higher than, say, half a volt. So right. it has a little bit more driving force um, for final, finer speed control. So it doesn't have to get across that threshold because it technically is. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to go on to our piezo knock sensor project. So here's kind of the uh, schematic of that. Um, we seem to misplace our slides, but basically how the piezo sensor works is it's um, it's kind of a pressure sensitive. So sort of. Yeah. It's um, a a material is uh, the piezo sensor works um, by the piezoelectric effect, and what the piezoelectric effect is is the generation of electric of electrical energy and charge by pressure, um, and vice versa. It's reversible. So a, a piezoelectric material that generates electricity by pressure, so if you squeeze it, um, electrons are knocked free. Also, if you apply electricity, it will create mechanical motion. That's how buzzers are, that's how the, the really really high-pitched buzzers are made. Um, they work by, by piezoelectricity. So essentially what this little disc has in it is a very, very thin disc of piezoelectric material. Um, now some, some of the most common piezoelectric materials include quartz. Uh, quartz crystals are actually piezoelectric and it's really cool. If you take two quartz crystals and knock them together in a dark room, sometimes you can get some luminescence to appear. So uh, a little spark. Yeah, some, a little spark because when you knock them together you create mechanical stress um, which in turn knocks some electrons free which energizes the which energizes the, the the crystal around it and creates some creates some light that you can see. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the material is inside inside this, but it it works quite well. Um, All right. Yeah. Oh, so what um, we're gonna do is we're gonna use this this piezoelectric sensor to detect a secret knock on your door because this this can detect some very very faint vibrations. It can be very sensitive if you tape it to a table or, or a door or something like that. And I believe the resistor shown in the schematic, it is a... One mega ohm. One mega ohm. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, it's backwards on here, but their color code on that is brown, black, green, gold. And the reason that we use the one mega ohm resistor is because sometimes the piezo sensor can generate some very high voltages depending on how much vibration is applied to it. And we need to be able to bleed off some of that excess power in the resistor, so it doesn't, so it doesn't accidentally fry the Arduino. Right. So this kind of it, it's it's kind of the same idea as the uh, e back EMF diode for the motor. It's 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 all so that we don't damage the Arduino. Um, if if all these excess voltages and things try to come back through it. This prevents that because instead of going back to the Arduino, it'll go through the resistor. Mm -hmm. It's round. We have our analog input. So there's the, the, piezo, the piezo sensor all connected up. This is a very simple circuit. Uh, we just connect the resistor in parallel across the piezo disk. Uh, pay attention to the polarity of the of the sensor because it is actually polarized. Red is positive, so that goes to your analog input. I'm not on the screen now. All right, a little bit. <laughs> the uh, the red is positive, so that goes to the analog input, and the blue is negative, so that is connected to ground. And now we're gonna set up the servo, which I'm gonna run and grab because it's in my other bag.
Right. So, um, also one thing we realized on this schematic, this black wire that just goes to the breadboard, that's unnecessary. Don't worry about it. Um, don't don't include that because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't wire. serve. That this wire, oh. remember we removed it. Oh yeah. Whoops. Mm -hmm. I know we're talking to the wire right here. So okay. Yeah, you just so. simple simply connect. You want the, I believe it's it's is it the yellow wire on the blue ones? Oh This yellow yeah. one to pin nine. Yeah. Well, let me let me explain a little bit about the servo real quick. Right. Um, if you've never used a servo, a servo motor is just a little tiny motor and gearbox inside this uh, inside this little package with a rotary encoder on it so it knows exactly where it is angularly at any given time. So servos are capable of some incredibly precise motion. So you can actually you can just tell the the Arduino to write a degree movement to mm -hmm. the servo and it will move exactly that number of degrees. These things are useful for for small precise movements uh, like control surfaces on remote control aircraft. In fact, this is these micro servos are used just for for just that um, to put proportional control onto like elevons on remote control aircraft. So on this, you've got uh, let's see if I can remember which ones you have. I believe it is the brown wire. On the blue servos, the brown wire is your ground connection. The red wire is, of course, positive, as it always seems to be. That's generally a convention, by the way. Red, red. positive. Uh, black is generally negative, although sometimes... It, uh, sorry, negative or ground, although sometimes manufacturers like to be a little bit tricky. Yes, yeah, sometimes always. you'll see black and black with white stripe. Black with white stripe is usually five volts, but again, always double check documentation. Yes. Because sometimes... yeah, we can't stress that enough. If you're having some problems or not really sure um, where to be, the first place to check is the documentation for the part in question because it's it's probably got the answer that you're looking for. Oh, do you want to tape that down? Yeah, I do. Uh, hang on, which pin do we put on nine? Um, nine. A zero. Wait, which pin? The, the servo, nine. Oh, yes, that's nine. Yeah. Okay. Servo Give a nine. piece of tape. And Hand over the tape. tape if you tape up. the piezo sensor to the to the tabletop, then it can it can more easily pick up the vibrations that you might see. Yes. So you want to tape it down, and then we'll have to calibrate it a little bit to mm -hmm. get it to work for this. And, of course, double-check my connections. Round. Signal. Okay. Okay. Should be okay. Should be okay. Uh, one now. other thing to note is that we had some issues. Though some of you might have these black servos, we had some issues uh, with getting the black servos quite right with this project. So uh, just be a little, be a little conscious, conscious of that. And then as far as the code, we suggest that you go ahead and download it, mm -hmm. uh, since it is quite a bit uh, extensive. You've got this up in the way still. Right. Um. So we're just, we're just going to go, we suggest that you download the code from our website and follow along as we go over a couple uh, important things. Well, let me change the view so it's easier to see. Um, 16, sure. Go. Okay. Perfect. So. Okay. So the first thing right up at the top, um, even even up in the very first line, uh, that include. Uh, this is the first time that we've used a library in our code. Now a library is just a collection of external methods and structs and other things that somebody else has written that you can then use in your project without having to write it yourself. In this case, the uh, the Arduino people have written a library of functions that basically that it, that encompasses most basic servo oper servo motor operations. Uh, so you don't have to write it yourself, which is very very nice. So you can either go to I think it's Sketch 
import library. If you want to just pull that up real quick to make sure. Yeah, sketch, yeah, import, sketch library. import library, and then you can select Servo, um, mm -hmm. which is the one we have here. Yep. You click that, it should add this include statement to your code. Yep, and there, there are several, if you, if you want to know how to import your own library, one that you found online, there are several tutorials for doing that. The main one is the best, and it's on the Arduino website. Right. And it's, yeah, usually any library you get, it's just a standard C header file. As you can see here, it's the servo.h, which is a C header file. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, did I write a separate calibration sketch for this? I don't think so. Okay. I did for Workshop 5. Oh, okay. Thinking of. Okay, so, what, we're just going to go through this a little, little by little. So, these first few lines, uh, the first three are defined statements. So, we, we talked about those before, how using a defined statement, essentially, every, every time, it, it's a, it's a pre-compile, or it's a compiler directive. So, every, mm -hmm. as the compiler is parsing your code, every time it sees LED pin, it replaces it with 13. Right. And I like to use these for most of my constants as opposed to things like const int, which is also a way to declare a constant, because defines take up no memory space. Right. They Whereas, basically say, so whenever the compiler runs through your code and sees that uh, sequence of characters, like mm -hmm. LED pin, it replaces it with 13. So right. it doesn't have to stick anything in memory, unlike a const int, uh, when your code is actually running. Right. Uh, which... While none of the none of the uh, projects that we've done so far have memory issues, it does it does end up happening, especially when you're dealing with large amounts of data. So uh, the next next of course is our our variables that we're looking at. Um, just simple like that. In sensor reading, servo servo. Now you'll notice that the servo is declared as a servo type, and that's the type of the library that we imported. Um, so that's very important that your servo is of type servo. Um, and as, as it says in the comments, in this servo library a maximum of eight can be declared. So this is, we're only using one. Yeah, so we only have one which is just called servo. Mm -hmm. um, and then setup, we set up our indicator LED, begin our serial connection, uh, those are all very, very standard. And then we do two servo-specific instructions, servo.attach and then the pin number. Um, so in our case, we attach the servo to pin 9. Now, of course, you might want to replace if you might want to pl replace 9 with a constant. You might want to define that up at the top of the file, maybe if you were to take this a little bit further. And then yeah. servo.write0. We initialize the server position to its neutral state. Yeah. All right, and then we have our loop here, which the first thing we want to do is we want to read in our knock value from the anal or the piezo sensor. So we simply read in a value, and then for debugging purposes, we print it out to the serial monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we compare it to the threshold, which we'll set here in a minute, uh, because that's a, that's the part that we need to calculate if it's period of enable to the threshold. Uh, we just print out a knock and turn on the LED pin. Turn on the LED pin and quote unquote unlock the door by running the servo uh, a little bit in both directions, first in one direction and then waiting and then a little ways back to simulate the unlocking of a deadbolt. Right. So uh, let's move on with calibrating this thing and figuring out what we need to set the threshold to. All right, so. Plugging it in now, I want to make sure it sees it. Board, com, K. Okay. Go ahead and, uh, so currently the threshold is set to a value of 20. So we'll upload this, see how it works, and then, of course, we want to check the serial monitor to see what values we're getting. So we're getting about zero. And notice as I knock harder and harder on the table, nothing's actually happening. Right, because it's quite faint. Okay, oh, I I'm think it's gonna... because that's unplugged. Oh, that would also do it. Alright, so we're going to stick a wire. Ah. I'm going to stick a wire here to kind of hold that in place. 
Okay. And then this isn't really in there. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's there. Barely. Stick, Let's just stick another one in there. Stick a wire here to kind of hold these little tiny well, wires. What we're doing, I know it's a little bit difficult to see. What we're doing is we're taking the little tiny, tiny wires um, that come off the piezo sensor and wedging them into the holes in the breadboard by sticking another wire in between them. So, watch the output now. You can see it jump. And there it goes. On a hard knock, it detects a knock. So it looks like our, our threshold is actually set to a pretty good value. Because I can knock it, I can knock on the desk at a fairly, it's a fairly brisk knock. It's not quiet. Um, you should be quiet, and then boom. Yeah. So it goes pretty well. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the, uh, the end of that. That's the workshop. Um, so this, of course, it just notices when there is a knock, which, as you might expect, is not particularly secure. <laughs> Somebody could. Somebody could, uh, you know, just knock on your door and open it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what our challenge is, is to create a system that will detect a secret knock. Now, the challenge code is up on our website, but we encourage you to try this before you, uh, before you actually look at the challenge code. We encourage you to try, uh, to try it on your own. And a little hint... I did is to listen for the first knock is to first listen for the first knock and then once you've heard the first knock then you can begin timing the intervals between each knock and store them in an array and maybe compare that to an array of the known times between your secret lock now you'll also need to include a system for slight inaccuracies because nobody can knock well except for maybe the people with perfect time like George Michael Bluth <laughs> um, no, but very very few people can knock with absolutely picture perfect accuracy to the millisecond range. So you're probably going to have to include some system for allowing for slight inaccuracies or inconsistencies. Uh, but I'll tell you from experience that that's not too hard. Yep. So again, try that out on your own if you're up for a challenge, or mm -hmm. just download it from our website and say it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and this has been our workshop for makeup. We will update the PowerPoint. Uh, we just realized it doesn't have our last project or the challenge on the PowerPoint online. So we will update that, get that updated as soon mm -hmm. as we can. And we hope everyone has a great break. And yeah. we hope to see you uh, compete in the winter design competition, which is again on February 4th. Um, it'll be kind of the atmosphere of uh, our workshops where you just come, you present your project, and then the IEEE uh, officers will vote. Well, not really vote. We will judge all the projects, mostly based on the project itself mm -hmm. um, and the amount of work you put into it and kind of uh, 